Thank you for the opportunity to be with you this, uh, this afternoon. I think this has been a, a great forum. Uh, I already tweeted about it, believe it or not, and that's one way, I guess, to, to communicate. And, um, you know, people back at the ACC can tweet to 10,000 people. So, I mean, this is, we need to communicate the challenges and the opportunities that we have, and I know uh, these would. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the, this is a great forum. So uh, what, what you will see is uh, it won't be much different of some of the thoughts that you had here. Uh, Bob Roberts, uh, our previous chief at, at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, I think it's a, a great for us to, to be able to do this in a duo. I want to thank Bill Ogden here and Mary Ellen uh, Bellivo, who really uh, helped also put uh, this presentation together. Well, uh, what we'll address in the next 30 minutes before we get a bad sign from Terry is uh, the diseases, I mean, what is the landscape that we're dealing with in cardiovascular disease? And I, I know Donna had uh, a nice preamble to that. We'll give you a feel from uh, a survey that we did in our practitioners. Uh, what are the current offerings and what are the future directions that the college is doing? So I'll do about 10 minutes, then Bob will do 10 minutes, and then we'll finish with another 10 minutes. So this is the landscape from a cardiovascular disease point of view, and we have to put it in the context of genetics, genomics, uh, Mendelian diseases from HCM to long QT, Marfan, familial dilated cardiomyopathy, in fact, and you can add some more to it. Uh, unfortunately, the most common diseases that we deal with in cardiovascular medicine do not belong in that area. Otherwise, we would have been having a very different conversation this afternoon. So the most common diseases, more than 90%, probably 95% of the diseases that we deal with are more of the complex genetic type. So I think that poses a challenge and that's part of the challenge that our practitioners, and I just want to remind you, I think this is an opportunity I think was just you know, talked about. One is that the college represents 43,000 individuals, professionals, and, and those professionals are, the majority are physicians, but also nurse practitioners, nurses, and also has a, a reach for international, we have about 6,000 international members, so whatever we decide, whichever way from an education point of view and impact, will have some global impact in addition to the whole cardiovascular care team that we're dealing with. And Donna also mentioned some pharmacogenetics opportunities and still challenges, although they seem very easy to apply. If you look around in practice, how many people are applying pharmacogenetics to, to this area of warfarin uh, and clopidogrel is, is still a minority. Now, let me share with you a survey, 150 cardiovascular professionals, and these are across the board, if you will, representative of these 40,000 members, meaning, I would guess, although I don't know exactly the numbers, that maybe 20, 25% are in academic practice, and the other are various kind of practices. Although you need to know that probably cardiology and other specialties is the practitioners are going into a different model which will impact how we talk about genetics and autogenetics, which is more of a uh, employed model. 70% of cardiologists nowadays are employed one way or another, either in academic institutions or hospital systems, and only 30% are in private practice, the traditional model. And things are still evolving. So the impact of what we do certainly would affect uh, what we're dealing with. So to the question of what is personalized medicine to the physicians that are answering, genetic testing is the most common, but it's interesting what personalized medicine, and it has some meaning to the particular person, is their age group, their gender, yes, molecular diagnostics, race, comorbidities, and socioeconomic status. So when we talk about personalized medicine, indeed it probably has all these connotations and we're, we're focusing mostly on genetics, genomics today. But when you personalize it, obviously it has to take many of these other things. Now to the question of percent of patient asking the cardiologist about personalized medicine, uh, the bottom line is about 6% of these patients. Now 
there is a heterogeneity depending on where you are. If you're a referral center, obviously patients are coming in because of that. But this is from the survey is about probably 6% of these patients are asking questions regarding their own condition and probably about genetics about it. Now, percent of patients that cardiologists are using personalized medicine. Not much different, about 7%. It depends of where you are, at times 20% of uh, the patients that a cardiologist can see, maybe in a, in a uh, really big referral center for HCM or other diseases, uh, I think that could be. But this is, in general, about the same. So we're talking about a conversation somewhere, somehow, or at least on the radar screen, which could be improved depending on the situation, about six to seven percent. The future of personalized medicine as to these individuals, the vast majority are just not sure because they are a bit confused as to where is the field going, going forward. Now, do they have hope for the future? Most of them put these categories to the future role of personalized medicine going forward, somewhat larger or much larger. However, if you ask them, and this is really, if you want to ask me, what is the bottom line? This is the bottom line that we as a community have to address is, what are the challenges to clinical implementation of personalized medicine? One, patient outcomes data. Tell me that indeed it will change the outcome if I do this test or I do something different. Payment reform, looking at value, who pays for what? I think that the value question just came before. CME, needing more knowledge regarding what are we talking about here. Guidance from professional societies, about 50% plus. Patient education. At the ACC, we have a cardiosmart.org. This is where our patient education portal. And we'll like to infuse more and more data and information and patients asking questions regarding that, but we still need to do quite a bit of that. Guidance from regulatory bodies. Update to medical school curriculum, which is I think is important, so, uh, and others. So I think all of them, in a way, are relevant. And, uh, and I think we have to, whichever way we take this conversation, we have to address several of these challenges that we're dealing with. And I, I really think that was, to me, among the most revealing because these are individuals in different kind of practices, from academic to private practice, rural or urban, and I think they're asking and they're wondering about the situation. They have hope for the future, but they have quite a few challenges for us to take forward. Now, I'm gonna ask Bob to come and, and tell us about some of the new discoveries and realities regarding uh, some of the uh, diseases in cardiovascular medicine, particularly where genetics uh, has some impact.